Mark chapter number 9. I was reading this chapter and a thought came to my mind in regards to uh, the earthly ministry of Jesus up to this particular point. He had been uh, ministering for about uh, three years. He started actually ministering at age 30 and then at age 33, of course, we know he was heading to the cross. And uh, the story here begins... Uh, uh, a very important part of the ending of not the life of Jesus, but the ending of his ministry that he can minister in heaven for you and me. And he's at the right hand of the Father right now. Look at verse 1, if you would, of Mark chapter number 9. The turning point for your life. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, Till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John. And remember something here. Up to this particular point, all the disciples were around Jesus, the, the twelve. But now he takes three specific men and uh, shows them something that's going to transpire. Something's going to take place that had never taken place before. And so he takes Peter, James, and John, we call them the inner circle of the disciples. And he takes them up to the high mountain apart from the other people. And there he was transfigured before them. And the Bible says, And his raiment became shining and exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller. Now you've got to understand what he's talking about here. A fuller in the Old Testament was like someone who took the sheets and uh, all the things and he, they dipped them in, it, probably today, Clorox or something that would make them or bleach them out. And uh, a fuller, what he did was make things clean, making the thought a pure thought. And it says in that verse, as so as no fuller on earth can, and wa can wipe them. And they appeared unto them, Elias, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now that's a very interesting thought there. If you're not, if you're not attending uh, adult Bible class on Sunday morning, you need to because Brother Danny Gannon is going to be teaching, he got, just got in this morning, on the book of Revelation. Now, you say, why did you bring that up before, uh, for you? Because in the tribulation period, there is going to be some witnesses. And we believe those witnesses are going to be Elijah and Moses. And he indicates that here even in Scripture. Verse 5, And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what he say, for they were so afraid. Now here's a turning point in Peter, James, and John's life. Look at the next verse. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Now let me stop right there, and I really want you to look up here. Folks, it's time for you to stop listening to other people and listen to what God has to say. Amen. You see, we hear so many voices in the world. We listen to this person, we listen to the news, uh, whatever channel it might be. We listen to our neighbors, we listen to our friends, maybe some relatives and so forth. But that advice isn't always that good. But Jesus always gives the right advice for our lives. He always gives that which is important for our lives. Here was a turning point in these men's lives, and not only them, but the other disciples, but specifically as he was speaking there. And in verse 8 says this, and suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. You see, the problem that we have a lot of times, folks, is this. We start getting our eyes and our ears listening to the wrong people or looking at the wrong things or, you know, taking the wrong direction in life. And here, Elijah and Moses were great men. God had blessed them greatly in leading the people of Israel. Matter of fact, these two men, Elijah and Moses, are greatly revered 
today, not only among Christians, but specifically the Jewish people. But Jesus was the one to be seen. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This was a turning point in their life. Now all of us have different turning points in our life, different events come into our lives. For example, someone might fall into ill health. Well, that turns your life in a different direction. You might lose your job. Well, that turns your life in a different direction. Other events might take and change your life completely. For example, uh, uh, how many of you played sports? Raise your hand. Played sports. Uh, in a ball game. Here, a, a guy who was a well-known uh, outfielder. And, I mean, just catches the ball endlessly. I mean, no matter what kind of ball is hit towards him, he catches it. I mean, those diving catches, Brother Ed, and he catches that ball. It doesn't seem like he's going to get there in time to catch that ball, but he catches that ball. One day, the ball's hit out there to him. And he runs, and it seems to be a very easy catch for him to catch that ball. But it slides right out of his glove. And that hit brings the leading run in to win the ball game. The whole course of that game has changed simply because of the fact of that which transpired. It's a turning point. History shows us over and over again. For example, my wife and I are Civil War buffs. And we love to study history. And we've been uh, uh, every place where the major events of the Civil War took place. For years when I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, five years I studied the Civil War from the viewpoint there, especially my, uh, Missionary Ridge and down there in uh, Georgia where the Chickamauga battlefield is. Then when we moved to New Jersey, we went uh, over to Gettysburg, which was a major turning point of the Civil War. And because of that, the Union Army was to be able, they took the upper hand and, of course, they won uh, the war. Really wasn't a win case because there were so many boys that did get killed and girls that uh, had affected their lives. But turning points... And I was thinking about that this morning, some turning points that, that not only happen here in our lives in this country, but turning points in the Bible. For example, you take for exam, uh, that illustration back in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. We have a man by the name of Naaman. He was a captain of the army of Syria. There was a problem in his life. He had leprosy. But a little maiden from the Israel that was taken into captivity stood up and said, Hey, I know how you can get rid of this leprosy. If you will listen to the man of God, if you do what the man of God uh, has to say, your life would be changed. And though he refused at first to do what the man of God told him to do, he finally went there to the Jordan River. And he ducked himself seven times in that water and he came up just as white, as clean as ink. Do you believe that story? Most certainly. It's in the Bible. And it's true. I was thinking about another event. There, a man by the name of Paul. His name was Saul first. And his name was changed later to Paul. Saul of Tarsus constantly uh, destroyed Christians' lives. And did everything he could because he thought he was doing the right thing. But one day he was on the road to Damascus headed towards trying to retrieve and get some Christians and put them in prison and put some of them to death. And the Bible tells us he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. That was a turning point of Paul's life. Because of that, Paul took became one of the greatest men for the cause of Christ this world has ever known. Now, wait a minute. That was a turning point in his life. You take there, you go to uh, Matthew chapter uh, uh, 26. You find Peter. 
Peter failed miserably. He denied the Lord. But the Bible says after he did, after the cock crew, that he went out and wept bitterly. That was a turning point in Peter's life. And because of that, you go to the book of Acts chapter 2. And God gave him the opportunity to preach the greatest message on that day of Pentecost. And over 3,000 people got saved. But the greatest turning point that I can give to you this morning is found there in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When Jesus Christ not only died upon the cross, but he rose from the grave. Amen, amen. That's a turning point for every person in all history and up to the present. But here in the book of Mark chapter 9, I want to give you some thoughts very quickly and I'm having to cut this thing short this morning. And that's all right because of everything else has been said. But I want you to look back here at Mark chapter 9. And I want you to see there on Mount Hermon what took place. That day as Jesus has, was transfigured before these three disciples. The turning point will come to each one of our lives when we take and we begin to listen to what God has to say. Look down at verse number 7, if you would, please. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Say the next two words with me. Hear Him. Folks, God has given us the message about Him. This is the Christian's hymn book, H-I-M. It's about Jesus Christ. All the way from the book of Genesis. You say, I didn't know He was even born. My friend, He was from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him and for him. Without him, nothing existed. You see, when you and I begin to listen to what Jesus has to say, I want to tell you something. It will change your life. Amen. It will give you the purpose for living. It will give you encouragement to live life at its fullest. God desires to change and help our lives. Our problem is we become what we call dull of hearing. The Bible over and over and over again says this. It says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And the Bible says over and over and over again about hearing God. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Are you listening to God? In the book of Matthew, very quickly, and I'll not have you turn there because of time, but in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says this in regards to the sower. The sower had sowed the seed. The seed, the Bible says, is the Word of God. And the Bible goes on to say there, and I'll read it to you specifically, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Now notice this, this all has to do with our intention in our own lives. We make that decision. We make that decision to become dull in hearing. We become, we become so caught up in ourselves, we're here listening to so many other voices that we forget that God wants us to hear Him. Then our eyes, we don't see the way we should. We close them. And then the Bible says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and be converted and be healed. You see, we all need the Lord to take away our dullness. We need the Lord to take away our sin. And so we need to listen. And the turning point in your life is when you and I will listen to what God has to say. After all, he knows a lot more than we do, doesn't he? He spoke everything into existence. He's still in control of all things. Matter of fact, the book of Colossians chapter 1 tells us that all things stay in motion. So all things exist through him. You think about this today. What if God would remove his hand off of planet earth? We'd go into a tailspin. You see, God keeps all things operating. God lets the sun and the rain shine upon the saved and the unsaved. Why? 
Because the kindness and love of God leads us to repentance. You see, God wants us to listen to him. And the best way I know that we can listen to him is by taking heed to what he said in this book right here. I doubt if he's going to speak from heaven like he did in Mark chapter 9. Now he could, couldn't he? God can do anything he wants to do. But here's how God speaks to us today. By the way, he doesn't add to this book, Brother Ed. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that we're not to add to or take away from the things that are written in the contents of this book. And so we're to listen to him. And so the first thing that will change your life, the first thing that will take and turn us to him is listening to him. I was reading a very interesting story, and I'll give this very quickly, in a book called The Directions uh, by James Hamilton. And one day he shared a story about listening. He told about before refrigerators. How many of you were around before refrigerators came into existence? Well, I just hit the edge of that part of life. And uh, we had an ice box. How many of you had an ice box? Raise your hand. Yeah. Anyway, they would take and they would, you know, freeze the water. They'd take and get the chunks in the wintertime, especially out of the creeks or so forth. They'd take them into a, what they call an ice house. And, and of course, it had these uh, sawdust and so forth. Uh, the guy who took, took care of this particular ice house... One day he was taking the, the load of uh, ice inside the ice house there, and his watch dropped off. He looked and looked and looked for that thing, but he had others look for it. He could not find that watch. Finally, when he gave up on it, little old boy, they knew what happened. Went into the ice house where nobody else was around, and he laid down on the floor of that ice house. And he got quiet. And pretty soon he heard that watch. Click, 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 click. And he found that watch. You know, folks, that's exactly what we're going to find out for our lives. What we've lost in not listening to God, if we just get still before God, God will speak to us if we'll permit him. So the first thing Mark says here is, look, if you're going to have a turning point in your life that's going to be for good and beneficial, you've got to stop and let God speak to you. And so he says here, this is my beloved son. Hear him. This is the second thing. The turning point will come when you are dissatisfied with a little in your life. You see... The things of this world cannot satisfy us. Would you agree with that? Uh, do you ever notice this? Uh, you get hungry and you eat, and a few hours, maybe sooner than that, you get hungry again. Why? Because physical food can never fully satisfy you. I mean, you can go to that big buffet, and we all buffet our bodies, don't we? And uh, a few hours later, or the next day, you say, Boy, I sure wish I could be back there again. You can if you go back and pay the money. And we'll eat again. And we're not satisfied. You see, God tells us the things of this world are temporal. But the things of heaven are eternal. Amen. So often we push away those eternal things. Linda, eternal things said here this morning. You see, what's making a difference is thinking about the eternal in your life. And God tells us your soul is going to live forever somewhere, either heaven or hell. And God wants you to have eternal life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 5, 24. You see, God not only wants you to listen to him, but he wants you to get dissatisfied with the little things of this world. Why? Because the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. And so Mark says, look, get dissatisfied with those little things. 
get dissatisfied with the things that really don't satisfy in the first place. Get your eyes on the right things. I, I don't usually bring in a lot of secular people as far as what they say and what they do, but I, I was really interested in something I read this past week, and I want to give it to you verbatim. Bill Gates. I know a lot of you folks don't care for Bill Gates. That's all right. I like Bill Gates because of the good equipment he's come up with and the Microsoft and all that kind of stuff. But Bill Gates had something to say, and I really want to share this with you very quickly this morning. He says there's some rules that you and I need to learn. He lays out 11 rules that students and you and I as adults do not learn in high school or college, but should. He argues that our feel-good, politically correct teachings have created a generation of kids with no concept of reality who are set up for failure in the real world. Now, he said that. And here's what he said. Life is not fair. Get used to it. Number two, the world won't care about your self-esteem. The world will expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about yourself. I like that one. Rule number three, you will not make $40,000 a year right out of high school. You won't be a vice president with a car phone until you earn both a high school and college degree. Rule four, if you think your teacher's tough, wait till you get a boss. He doesn't have a tenure. Number five, flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Your grandparents had a different word for burger flipping. They called it opportunity. Now, he had a lot more on here, but I'm not going to share with all those things. Here's what I'm saying. Get dissatisfied with the little and reach out for the most. Amen. And the most you could ever get in your life is Jesus. That's right. You agree with that? Let's hear an amen for Jesus. You see, we have forgotten that Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my all. You see, we forgot about the most important things in life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance. We've forgotten about those things. See, it's not about us, folks. It's about Him. And Mark says, wait a minute, hear him. This is my beloved son, God says, hear him. So the first thing that God wants us to do in a turning point in our life is to get our ears set up to listen. And then secondly, get dissatisfied with being just, you know, who we are. Move on. I was thinking of an illustration very quickly. That was blind Bartimaeus. All those years, he was blind. And one day he got dissatisfied with being blind. I mean, after all, he heard about this man, Jesus, could, who could take and restore the blind and give them the sight. And Bartimaeus says, I'm going to get to Jesus. And folks, you know what? He did. And God gave him his sight. You see, until you get dissatisfied with the type of person you are and your heart being not met with being a content in there without the presence of the Lord, hey, you're not going to do anything about it. God says, come to me. All ye that labor and heavy laden, guess what he'll do? He'll give you rest. He'll give you peace of mind. He'll give you joy. But we forget about that. Wait a minute. Let me give you something else very quickly. Look at verse 8. The turning point will come when you get focused off of yourself and on Jesus and the needs of others. You see, when you get focused on Jesus, that will change your life. Look at verse 8. And suddenly when they had looked around about, they saw no man anymore. I'd like to stick this in here. I'm not adding the scripture. I'm just giving you a thought. They saw nothing but Jesus. They didn't see what they needed. They didn't see their wealth. They didn't see their neighbors. They didn't see, you know, all that they could have. But they saw Jesus. And I think that's what all of us need to do is 
turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full on his wonderful face. Watch this. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. And that's what we need. But wait a minute. You and I need to understand something. Why should we see Jesus? Because number one, and if I'd take you back, because of time I will not, but in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1 up through chapter 3, it talks about here's why you should put your trust in Jesus. Because number one, he's better than all the prophets. Yes, better than Elijah and Moses. He's better than the angels. You know, we have so much talk about angels, and I'm not against angels. But you better get your eyes up on Jesus. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priest. He's better than the covenants. He's better than all things you, that you and I can imagine. And then Mark comes down to verse 14 through 19 very quickly before I close. The turning point will come when you are willing to realize something is missing in your life. When you, and I'm not just talking about if you're here without Jesus this morning, I'm talking about you as a Christian. That there's something missing in your life. And a lot of folks are going through life with something missing. They know something is missing, but just don't do something about it. Something is missing. You have to realize, God says, we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. And when we just meet our emotional needs or we meet our physical needs and don't meet our spiritual needs, you've got something missing. You see, he's talking about the spiritual side of your life. Do you take time daily reading your Bible? Do you take daily, a daily time in uh, prayer? You see, God says, wait a minute. Just take... And stand still for a few minutes and admit that there's something missing in your life. I mean, used to, as a Christian, you used to enjoy the Word of God, but something's happened. You used to enjoy going and telling other people about Christ, but something's missing. What has happened? Well, you see, we get ourselves in the way. And we forget that Jesus is to be the focal point. And he's not in our daily activities. Remember the song? And he walks with me. Say it with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. You see, none other has ever known. I want to ask you today. What's missing in your life? When you take and have a turning point to see, number one, you need to listen. Number two, get dissatisfied with the little that you have in your life. And then you see you're not putting Jesus in the proper place in your life. As number one, you're missing out on life. Listen to this. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it, say it with me, more abundantly. Do you have it? This could be the turning point in your life today if you let God show you. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Let's say that. Hear him. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me, would you please?